Joe Harriot revival. He was runner-up for the, uh, whatever it was they gave away, the Ivan Fellow Award, as the best instrumental composition of the year. I think he'd earned him more money in one lump than he'd ever seen in his life. As you know, the lot of the jazz musicians uh, is, is pretty hard. Mm. And Joe, I don't like to say this, but I'm going to say it, especially in this time of uh, Ugandan emigres and so forth. I think Joe suffered greatly from being a black man. Greater than other people? Certainly. Why, Dennis? I mean, I didn't notice it myself. Oh, you wouldn't notice it. And certainly among other jazz players, you wouldn't notice it. But in the greater world where a musician can enter and make money by doing sessions and joining big bands and so forth, there was, and I believe, in my heart still is a great prejudice. And I think, uh, unfortunately, the only man who could really back me up on this is also dead was the late uh, Leslie Driver Hutchinson. And I think Joe definitely suffered from this in the bigger world which would have acknowledged him.
half child really and I suppose this led to some of his problems um, of, the, of automatically assuming that everybody uh, around him in whatever sphere it was thought uh, along the same lines as him and if uh, say some other point was raised by someone he would go on talking as though this hadn't been mentioned at all. I remember at one gig in Hitchin where in fact he, he, he was rather a bad lad on the bandstand and didn't do something that we'd arranged was going to happen and uh, we confronted the whole band in fact confronted him with this afterwards and uh, it was as though we were making a conversation to someone in the opposite corner and he went on talking but he was saying something quite different he was just talking about free form which actually had nothing to do with this particular point i tell you it made him sort of impregnable I oh ab absolutely but why then yeah. at the end michael was he so apparently alone i thought well perhaps for this reason you know, uh, he he created his own world, and and those were his limits, um, in this sense that we're speaking. But in other senses, uh, in that he could move into different musical scenes, he was um, he was very ready and able to to give. Um, we did the poetry and jazz in concert, which was organised by Jeremy Robson for about five years together from 62 to 67 and um, I think he was he was really thrilled to be working with poets with the spoken word which was something that uh, I suppose was new to him he, he used to take tremendous delight in it and made great friends with, uh, with a number of the poets particularly Danny Absey well that speaker was Michael Garrick I went to talk to him this afternoon at the cockpit theatre in London where he was rehearsing for a Fanfare for Europe concert later on in the day. And hearing him talk of Joe Harriet's involvement with poets like Danny Absey and Jeremy Robson prompts me to tell you also that Joe, in spite of a kind of aloof pride, was musically at home in all sorts of um, contexts. I telephoned Chris Barber this afternoon, knowing that Joe had appeared often with Chris's band. And Chris pointed out that back in 1953, Joe had occasionally appeared with Ken Collier's band, with considerable enjoyment. His appetite for music was voracious, said Chris, and if you threw a tune at him he didn't know, he didn't need much showing. But uh, to his involvement in poetry and jazz, here he is with Sheik Keen, Michael Garrick, and the poet Jeremy Robson with part of a poem called A Face in the Crowd. I look for you in a crowd. You're not to be seen, only a wave of salt white faces, images on the screen. Someone distant, can it be? No, a, a trick, a figment, a simple longing of the mind. Sudden panic, you won't come. I feel the gap you'll close spring open with a force which cracks when comfort tumbles from its cosy latch. Then you appear. Half an hour late, apologies, a smile, a good excuse. My longing turns to irritation and then to longing again indication of my love's dimension. story of, about uh, about Joe standing outside a club in a northern city after the gig in a little back street um, with his alto case neatly down by his side so a musician coming out of the club entrance and seeing two women really fighting going at each other in, in the road with their handbags screaming clawing at each other and there's Joe standing there quietly mm -hmm. and he looks around and he says oh it's okay they're fighting over me <laughs> and that's really true. I, how can I say? But I could imagine it being being true. Um, 
Another lovely one. He was in my front room uh, when I lived in Camberley, and he, there was a lot of trees outside. And we were talking about free form, and I think he was holding forth to the audience gathered there. And he was uh, saying, no, he said, oh, everybody, uh, most people, they're playing, they're playing in the room. They're in here with us. They're playing in the room. But what I play is out the window, out of the window. <laughs> Musically, Michael, was he somewhere near the truth? Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, he, he was, he was, you know, an original voice and his concept of what he called free form um, was his own. Um, especially Sheikh and Pat Smythe um, expanded, you know, his basic concept, um, which remained um, very much his own and sort of didn't, didn't take on in any other areas. I mean, when, when, when the later um, musicians who played freely in, in the 1960s came along, I suppose the Westbrook band and people, um, well, I, I gave them Parker now. You can't really see that they've derived specifically from Joe. What he did was something of his own, mm. and which I admire very much. on the same LP as that version of Revival we played earlier. Joe Harriet, Pat Smythe at the piano, Bobby all drums, Coleridge Good on the bass. On flugelhorn was Shake Keane from St Vincent, who came to Britain soon after Joe, and who went to Germany eight years ago to work with Kurt Edelhagen and returned here to look around. He's a poet in his own right, incidentally, at the turn of the year. Well, naturally, I went to talk to him about Joe and to ask him particularly about the free form music they were both into so early. Well, he was always among the front runners as a saxophone, as an alto saxophone player. I mean, albeit, like, as you say, like all other saxophone alto players, he, you know, he had been touched by Parker. But um, I think the free form thing was in him long before we started playing it. He, we used to talk um, quite a lot, if, if Joe can be said, to talk. <laughs> Before I joined the quintet, I mean, that is to say, we used to what 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 somebody is jocularly called. Uh, we used to try to unscrew the inscrutable. That is, we used to deal in all kinds of metaphysical um, aspects of all kinds of occult situations and whatnot. But anyway, in the middle of this, um, we sometimes used to speculate on what would happen if 
if you played, tried to play jazz without chords. And we, we once invented a system called the monochordial system, in which, I mean, this was invented around a breakfast table over fried bread and eggs or something. Um, the monochordial system in which you simply rely on uh, ascending and descending the minute chords, and you try to do what you can with those, and try to keep those sort of jazz feelings. Well, this was years before we actually started playing free form. But um, somewhere around 1960, we got together and decided to invent this particular sort of approach. Looking back on it, Jay, do you think it was successful musically now? Well, um, it was popular, and it, it earned the disapproval of the of the established jazz musicians at the time, which was a sure sign that it was successful. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it, for me, it was certainly one of the most exciting periods in my sort of jazz career, because um, it was possible, you see, to, 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 to mix the, the then established jazz, this sort of bottom cool, with this new thing. I mean, when you got bored with, you know, sort of playing up and down the court, you could always launch into you know, a series of, of um, notes, and Joe would launch into a series of counter notes. I mean, most of his life he'd been launching into a series of counter notes, figuratively and, and otherwise. And uh, Bobby or Phil Seymour, the drums, you know, would take it up and Cole on the bass and Pat Smythe on the piano. And um, I had a lot of fun. But um, we, we, we thought of it quite seriously. Mm. And I think it was uh, musically an excellent thing to do. But of course, Joe played in all kinds of situations. Perhaps the most remarkable of them being with the Indian violinist composer John Mayer. With a double quintet, Indian musicians, and jazz musicians with a flute player as a kind of referee, they made some striking music, some of the best of which was on Raga Mega. Joe is a musician. If, if, if you, I mean, uh, things like, when you, have, when you name a profession, you usually think of somebody behind this profession. Um, somebody who's actually doing something. You tend to separate the, 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 the occupation or whatever it is from the person doing it. With Joe, this is impossible. He, he was an alto sax player. And um, if alto sax players could ever have been genetically developed from, you know, some sort of amoeba millions of years ago, then Joe was that. He wasn't really a person. He, 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 he couldn't think of, um, he couldn't understand relationships. He could only understand relationships when you were playing music. And um, so he was, well, I suppose the, 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 the most generous way to put it was that he was a, 
an incomplete sort of um, talented artist. This explains, I suppose, the awful loneliness of this circumstances uh, towards the end, which I've only really just learned about. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was, um, as I say, it was in the cards. Um, it would have been difficult to imagine Joe spending his, his last years, you know, with jolly company, you know, over Christmas turkey or something like this, and um, having kids around him and, you know, friendly conversation and whatnot. I should imagine that up until the end he must have been thinking about... Um, what he was going to do next on, on the saxophone, regardless of who said no or yes.